Good morning. Welcome to the United Way of Johnson, Washington County's uh, panel discussion, Why Should I Get a COVID Vaccine? So I'm Rebecca Needs. I work at Green State Credit Union as the Vice President of Governmental Affairs and also head up our community investment initiative that I'm, I'm really excited about that part of my job as well. And huge, huge, huge supporter of our United Way here locally. They do so many great things and proud to be a volunteer and proud of all the services they're providing, including today's panel discussion. So just to review the format real quick with you, we have our panelists and appreciate their time today to answer the questions you've submitted in advance. And they, in, a, in addition to those questions, they will present the facts and dispel some fiction centering around the COVID vaccine. Also, thank you all for attending and submitting your questions. We have had so many questions submitted. Um, we don't believe we'll get through all of them and unfortunately won't be taking any during the call just in the interest of time and to keep us all on task. So one last reminder, um, you may want to switch from your gallery view to your speaker view so we can kind of block out the other things that are going on and really uh, hear the great expertise that we are fortunate to have in this community and with us today on the panel. So Dr. Schickel, I will start by introducing you. Dr. Stephen Schickel, Vice, or, uh, MD, VP Medical Affairs, CMO of Mercy, Iowa City. Dr. Schickel served as the Medical Director of Mercy Emergency Care Unit, ECU from 2005 to 2018 before accepting the role of Vice President Population Health, Quality and Outreach. He has served as Chief Quality Officer since 2015 and also currently serves as Mercy's Chief Medical Officer. His responsibilities include, in, include medical staff affairs and the Population Health Services Organization, previously called the ACO Initiatives Team the ECU and Mercy on Call, for which he is the medical director, also report to him. We're also fortunate to have Randy McDowell, PharmD, MS, BCGP, BCPS, FAPHA, co-owner at Towncrest Pharmacies. Dr. Randy McDowell is professor of pharmacy management and innovation at Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy and co-owner of Towncrest, Stolen Towncrest, and Towncrest Compounding Pharmacies. He's also the co-founder, co-services, nursing home counseling. Um, oh, I'm sorry. He also oversees Towncrest Pharmacy Clinical Services, including MTM services, nursing home counseling, wellness screening, immunizations, and adherence services. His responsibilities for development, implementation, and quality assurance for all aspects of the clinic and services. He is, a board, he is board certified in geriatrics and is a pharmacotherapy specialist. His areas of interest include community-based outcomes research, pharmaceutical education, geriatrics, disease state management, student development, and the development of patient care initiatives in the community pharmacy setting. Wow, what an impressive list from both of you. So, Let's start with you, Dr. Schickel, and please share two to three minutes, a brief out, uh, opening statement of your interest and, and your interest of uh, visiting with us today. Well, great. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And I wanna uh, give a special thanks to United Way of Johnson County and Washington County for hosting this. Um, I think it's uh, extremely timely uh, within this sort of seemingly never ending uh, COVID pandemic. And so I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so just to give, uh, sort of set the stage a little bit about our upcoming uh, conversation, um, the latest uh, data regarding COVID uh, here in the United States uh, is that approximately 32 million people have tested positive in the United States for COVID, uh, a huge number. And, and also, uh, of the people that have been infected with COVID, there have been 470,000 deaths in the United States. And to give a, a little bit of a, of, of a reference for that, uh, that means that in the United States, 
one out of 10 people in the United States have tested positive for COVID. And one out of every 600 people in the United States have died from COVID. Uh, those are just astounding numbers. Uh, and so this pandemic is certainly once in a century and, and, and hopefully it'll be even more rare than that. And we are still uh, in the pandemic. Uh, I know people have pandemic fatigue, but we're, we're still there. Uh, the, the, the good news is that uh, currently over 50% of the US adult US population have received their first shot. A, a little over a quarter of the adults have been completely vaccinated. Um, the downside of that though, is that the uh, demand for vaccinations has been decreasing. Um, this is while our supply is going up. Initially, there was a, a huge rush for vaccine. Now there are doses that are going, uh, are staying in the freezer or the refrigerator because the demand is less. And I want people to know that we are at the crossroads with this pandemic. Uh, what we're fighting against um, is, are, are these mutations that are, are showing up. Uh, right now there's the Brazil mutation, South African and the, the UK variant uh, that are here in the United States. And the longer that people remain unvaccinated, the greater chance these mutations have to uh, cleverly work their way around our vaccines. So it's very important that we get people vaccinated to stop the ability of these, uh, these, this virus to continue to mutate to outsmart our vaccinations. Um, the, the, goal, the, the holy grail is the herd immunity. Uh, they estimate somewhere around 80% of people vaccinated and immune will get us there so we can return to normal life. A simple answer to the question, why get vaccinated? It's for, number one, it's for each individual themselves. Beyond that, it's their family members, their loved ones, their friends, their community, uh, their children to go back to school, their state, and ultimately our entire nation um, and our economy. Without getting that herd immunity so we can return to normal, our economy can never be what it was and people will not get back to work. Um, and so I just, uh, the brief introduction, I want to end with uh, something that our infectious disease expert, Dr. David Kushner said recently. Um, basically with COVID, there are three choices, okay? And only three choices. You can either get the vaccine, you can get COVID and then get the vaccine, or you can get COVID, okay? That's it. And out of all those, uh, out of those three choices, obviously getting COVID is the worst possible choice. 20% um, of people getting COVID actually end up with serious illness, sometimes resulting in death. So the vaccine is our ticket out. It's a remarkable, vac a remarkable vaccines we have available. And I can't tell people enough that get vaccinated. It's, it's in your own interest. It's in your family's interest. It's in your, our nation's interest. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Rebecca. Thank you. And Dr. McDonough, I think I mispronounced your, I think I was calling you the wrong thing in the intro. I'm sorry. I went to school with the, the other name. So <laughs> apologies. I'll kick this over to you now. Thank you. And I've been called a lot of things, so that's perfectly okay. But, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. And first, I'd like to thank United Way and also like to thank Dr. Shekel for giving me the invitation to be here with him. You know, our pharmacy here in Iowa City at Towncrest, uh, we've been vaccinating since the last week of December. This week, we'll hit 10,000 individuals that we have vaccinated. You know, I look at um, all the things that we've learned when this pandemic first hit, and I can still remember in March, um, looking at what was happening in the city of New York and realizing how hospitals were becoming overwhelmed, the communities were becoming overwhelmed, and preparing ourselves for what could possibly happen in the Midwest and in Iowa City. And what we didn't know at that time and, and how much we've learned since that. And you know, we understand the trans transmissibility of it. We understood what we need to do to protect each other, how to protect our employees, how to protect our patients. And then as the vaccines came out, you know, looking at the, the information, because I know people have talked about how the vaccines came out fast, so there's some safety issues. Although it was an abbreviated time as far as the time it came out, um, they had to still meet those clinical phases to demonstrate its efficacy and also its safety. I did not hesitate to get the vaccine. In fact, I was frustrated 
that I was kind of put on a waiting list because we were trying to get some of the hospital workers um, vaccinated before we went to some of the community-based healthcare workers. But boy, I tell you, I jumped on that as soon as I had that um, availability to be able to do that. And the same thing with all my family. Um, some of them had to wait. My daughter most recently uh, got her shot and she got the Johnson and Johnson before they came out with the pause. And, uh, but you know, I feel good that she got the shot. Absolutely. You know, she's at low risk and there's only six cases and it made sense why they may have paused that just to see what were the commonalities and how do we treat it appropriately. Um, but the Johnson Johnson is just on pause and, and we do see that um, probably coming back here soon after the um, have a chance to study that more and come out with the precautions um, and treatment strategies if that does happen to someone. But that being said, we are promoting giving vaccines uh, to everybody. As Dr. Shekel said, we need to get back to normalcy. Whether or not we have a magic number for herd immunity, the bottom line is you want to make sure you're protected. Even if you don't have symptoms, it doesn't mean you won't have lingering symptoms um, of some of the things where we see it might be um, going into the heart tissue or it might be going some other tissue of the body that you also have things where you're just not as um, alert or you're not feeling as well, you're tired, more fatigued. As I tell my family and my friends, it's like, man, you just don't want to get that thing. So get yourself vaccinated. And so, you know, we're happy to provide people with the information. I'm an evidence-based guy. I hope you can tell with the introduction, you know, I'm about the data, I'm about the literature. And right now the literature is telling me that this is a safe and effective uh, strategy to help us get uh, back to normalcy within our communities. Well, great. Let's stick with you for just a minute, uh, Dr. McDonough. And we have several questions just about the vaccine, the development, the contents of the vaccine itself. Um, so let's start with um, what exactly is the vaccine and why are there two shots? Yeah, well, let's start with the um, different types of vaccines because we have three right now in the United States that have been approved and obviously the Johnson Johnson being paused, but um, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine um, are very, using a technology that has been used in oncology or in cancer patients. So it's not like it's a brand new technology. It has been used in and other therapeutic areas, but it was the first time it was actually used in the vaccines, but it's using something called messenger RNA and messenger RNA is something that helps to make proteins. And so they've actually used this technology so that the messenger RNA that's in the vaccine helps our own cells develop the proteins that are similar in structure to those spikes that you see on the virus. So you're not getting the virus and it's not getting into your DNA. All it's doing is it's giving you something that looks like there's a virus in your body, although it's not the virus, it's just a protein that it's actually seeing, and then your body develops an immune response. So that's the Pfizer and Moderna. Both of those are two shots. Why is that? Well, what they found out is that one shot um, may provide up to maybe 50% um, type of immunity, but when you get that second shot, it really boosts your immunity up to about 90 to 95% uh, protection. And so because of that, they just felt like, you know, getting two shots is going to give you maximal protection. So we tell people, you know, the first shot primes you, the second shot boosts you. And it's going to be that booster shot that gives you the full protection. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is using a different type of uh, technology. It's using a, a, a virus, adenoviruses, which are the common cold, but they've been um, to a point where they're not going to cause any disease but it's a way to be a vector. So kind of think about the Trojan horse where you had the soldiers and the horse. Well, you're using the adenovirus to actually put genetic material so that again, it's creating within your cells that genetic coding for those spikes. Again, you're not getting the virus. You're not getting anything similar to the virus. All it's doing is creating the protein. So your body starts to creating the immune response. The Johnson Johnson show that with one shot, they get up to uh, 70 plus um, efficacy as far as preventing the disease. But um, as you've seen with some of the data that's out there, um, over 90% is preventing serious disease. So all three vaccines are something that, you know, we tell people, if you have access to a vaccine, get it. Very good, thank you. And Dr. Schickel, this would be a great follow-up, maybe you could answer, and that is, or, or add anything else to that. Um, so that relies, Fitz and Johnson relies on uh, some bits of genetic code, much like a Trojan horse, it was just explained. Um, so will that change someone's DNA? Um, yeah, 
Definitely not. Um, it, the DNA in no way can be incorporated into uh, the patient's or the recipient's DNA. Uh, and, and so that's been proven to be completely safe. And, uh, you know, Randy might have additional information on that, but none of these vaccines uh, interfere or are incorporated into any of our DNA. Certainly the mRNA is not even DNA, but the uh, DNA that is associated with the adenovirus is in no way can be incorporated into our uh, DNA. Yeah, right. it, does not, it does not get into our nucleuses of our cells where we right. have the DNA. So it's, yep. it's completely safe that way. There's nothing um, that's gonna affect your genetic coding. Right. And, and uh, one, one thing about the uh, Johnson Johnson, and maybe Randy can uh, uh, comment on this, but it's been theorized that in fact, if the Johnson Johnson vaccine was given in two doses, it would increase its efficacy uh, probably similar to the um, Pfizer and the Moderna. Uh, obviously, the advantage of a single shot is it's going to reach a lot more people and be reliably given to more people. And certainly the requirements for keeping that uh, vaccine uh, in the very low temperatures isn't there, which makes it much more convenient. Our, you know, We want to get as many shots and vaccinations out to as many people as possible. Absolutely. And I totally agree. And so, you know, when you have a 70% plus efficacy, that's a pretty good efficacy. In fact, if you look at the flu shots that we get, it's usually a 70 plus efficacy with those as well, too. So that's part of the reason why they were able to get the one shot. You know, 50% is okay, but it's not great. And I'd rather get to that, you know, that second dose so I can get to that 95 plus. But you're absolutely right. If there was a second dose or booster dose, that would just boost your immune response even better. Yeah, and, and the CDC initially, their goal, if I understood it correctly, was to get at least a 50% efficacy. Uh, and the pharmaceutical companies just knocked it out of the park. Uh, getting up to 95% is almost unheard of, and it's just uh, way more than, than we had hoped for. So the vaccines are effective and they're safe. And so what you've just said is that getting even the first dose of Pfizer and Moderna is great, but you need that second dose to raise the efficacy. That is correct. And, and I wouldn't even hesitate. Now, remember when I tell people, you know, to get the full efficacy of this thing, you want to get the second shot. But with the second shot, you just have to be aware that's boosting, right? What's already been primed. So we have something in our immune system called memory cells. And that's great to have that because when you're exposed to the virus subsequently, boom, you got an immune response that happens right away. So when you get that second shot, you're going to have this boost of your immune system. That boost is going to probably cause you to feel a little bit run down. And it's, it's dependent. I tell you, I, I've talked to a lot of people trying to figure out who's going to have it. And I can't tell you who's going to have a, a, a reaction that's more severe than another person. But the most severe reaction that we've had out of 10,000 um, has been people who've been you know, um, in bed, just feeling flu-like type of symptoms for about a day no longer than two days and they bounce back right away. And, uh, but most people might be for just a half a day or one day. And for some people, nothing besides a sore arm. And so I tell people, just be prepared to have a sore arm. <laughs> and well, one thing to add, I don't want people to feel like they're really, they're disadvantaged significantly at all by getting the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, uh, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine has been proven to be extremely effective up in the 90 percentile or 90 percent similar to Pfizer and Moderna to prevent serious illness and death. So it, it is a good vaccine and it's one shot, it's convenient. So people shouldn't feel like they, they got a second class vaccine. Dr. Shanko, I appreciate, if I can okay. just follow up with that, I appreciate that you said that because you have had people saying, well, I really want that one that's gonna yeah, give me that, that extra push. Um, but at the end of the day, um, to me, it's like, what's the, what's the vaccine you have access to? Are you someone that can get the second shot? You know, there's some people where it just might be more difficult for them to go back to get a second shot. Um, so if you can get access to any of the vaccines, get it, because all of them are going to prevent serious disease and all of them are efficacious as far as preventing the disease, if, you know, overall. Great follow-up. Well, and a question came up from one of our uh, guests that's, that asked if you've already gotten the Johnson & Johnson and certainly with that on pause at the moment, should they be worried? And um, are there people that should not get the Johnson & Johnson shot if it comes back on the market? I have a story about that. 
So we were actually started a clinic at six in the morning for an employer group that won the Johnson and Johnson. So it was right. It was the day of that they came out with the reporting. And so we're right in the midst of it all. When all of a sudden all the phones start lighting up with all the news flashes that were happening. So people were very aware of that. So at that point we had to make a decision, right? We already given it to most of the people. We still had about a dozen more people to give it to. So our decision was, well, let's make sure they're informed. And so we provide them with the data saying this was not a mandatory um, stoppage of the vaccine. It's a recommended thing. Um, it's six cases out of 7 million cases. And it seems like there was a commonality where there was low platelets. And so, and then part of the problem was it was treated not the right way using heparin, um, which caused more of a, a, a bad effect with it. So they're trying to figure out how do you actually treat these clots if you have it. That's why it was put on pause. And I'll be honest, every single person, which included the women of those ages that they were talking about, decided to get it. So then we tell them, okay, if you decide to get it, these are the symptoms to look for. And the window where they saw they actually had the reaction or the, the blood clots was between six and 13 days. So if you get past that two to three week period, you can consider yourself that you're pretty well safe at that point, because that's what they knew at, at this point with those six cases. As I told you, my daughter got the shot, no regrets. Um, you know, I just think again, I think it, it was out of an abundance of caution. I think that's exactly what the CDC said. It's of abundance of caution just to make sure they fully understand and they can provide the right information to the healthcare professionals about what was causing um, or the commonality with these blood clots, but six cases out of 7 million. So it's very rare, um, but it's to me, it's still a vaccine that I would promote when it comes back out to make sure that uh, you're getting vaccinated. And uh, one thing to add to that, uh, it, it certainly is a, a, a limited group of individuals. And I think most likely they'll come out and, and and approve it again with uh, precautions or certain warnings within that certain group. I think a very interesting statistic for people to understand is that COVID itself carries a significant risk for the same condition. And in fact, uh, the same group that uh, has COVID is eight to 10 times more likely to have this condition called cerebral uh, vascular uh, sinus uh, occlusion. So, uh, it's the risk of, of the vaccination versus getting COVID. It's eight to times more risk getting COVID. So people have to put that in proper perspective. Great follow-up. So the next question I have from one of our uh, guests is, if you have a pre-existing condition um, or medical issue, someone with an autoimmune disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, or if they've received treatments for their immune response or that impacts their immune response like chemo um, or bone marrow transplants, should they get the vaccine and will they get protected by it as much? Dr. Shekhar, you wanna go first on that one? Uh, yeah. The, the, uh, um... What they believe is uh, people with autoimmune disease um, or immunocompromised, um, actually they, they are known to have a lower uh, immune response, but at the same time, these are the people that are high risk uh, for COVID and, and the complications that go with that. So it's very important that these people do get vaccinated. Um, and uh, certain uh, people on certain cancer therapies, for example, uh, they're felt to be at higher risk for not having a significant immune response, but all of these people will benefit from getting vaccinated. Totally agree. Um, and you know, that's a common question that we get, right? And one thing I tell people is, remember, you're not going to get COVID-19 virus from the vaccine, right? You're just not going to get that. So that you don't have to worry about that. The biggest thing is, you know, to mount a good immune response, you don't want to be immunocompromised, as Dr. Shekel said. So you may not mount as big of an immune response, but you're going to mount an immune response. And so it's important that you get it because you are at high risk of the COVID-19 virus. Therefore, you should get the vaccination. Thank you. Let's move on to children or youth. And most kids are, as we've been told, at a low risk. Uh, for contacting COVID-19, uh, certainly in the fall of 2021. Uh, can, sh should they get vaccinated? 
When will children under 16 get vaccinated? Is that safe? Um, I'll, I'll start that out and then I'll let Randy uh, take over on that. Um, right now, there are studies going on for uh, uh, adolescents uh, and children 12 to 15. So far, the results are good. In, uh, in uh, vaccines like this or any approval of drugs, they have to go in a stepwise fashion. They start with the adults, show that it's effective and safe, and then they move to, down to the younger age groups. Um, I, I have heard uh, reports that this may be approved for this age group, 12 to 15, within actually several weeks. And then they will continue down in the age groups until finally they're going to check it out for uh, uh, infants six months and older. So I certainly anticipate that it's going to be safe and effective. It's just a matter of doing all the proper steps to make sure that number one, it's safe. And number two, it works in these age groups. So Randy, anything to add to that? Yeah. The only thing I'd add to that is, you know, it's interesting to see, especially in hospitalizations more recently, uh, because we have done a, a good job of vaccinating the high risk older patients. And you, what you're seeing is the people who are going to the hospital a lot now are the younger, gen, you know, younger populations of people. And part of it, the variants might be different too, as far as how it affects people of different ages. So yes, I would encourage people, especially those who are 16 years of older with Pfizer, you go to 16 with Moderna, you can go to 18. And I, so I, I was very encouraging for me the other day when I had parents bring their 16 and 17 year olds in and they signed off for the, the child to get the shot. And I was happy to see that, but it was also happy to see that the the adolescent was very happy about getting it because they want to, you know, see their grandparents. They um, want to have a more normalcy type of a life as well, too. The studies are going on. I do see in the future that there will be the, the 12 to 15, as Dr. Sheckel said, and then they'll start moving it down um, to younger ages and studying that as well, too. Um, so, yeah, I do see that this will continue on. Dr. or McDonough, I think this is a good one for you because of your pharmacy uh, business and you're a pharmacist. Can parents, you said you had to have parents sign off. Can parents require their children to get shots or vaccinations? Yeah. Can, can um, the, if the parents don't want their children to get them, can the children get them? Um, yeah. yeah. If they're 18, yes. If they're less than 18, no. Um, because the, we, again, in, someone actually asked me, because um, again, as I said, we've done the Pfizer uh, for some of the 16 and 17 year olds more recently. And I had one of the parents ask me, what well, do I need to be there for the second shot? I'm like, yes, okay. because you know, part of the process that we use, because we want to ensure that safety. And that is we keep people for 15 minutes and it's a strong 15 minutes. And if they've had any type of reaction, severe reaction to food, vaccine or medicine in the past, we'll be even more abundantly cautious and keep them for 30 minutes. And I tell the parents, if something happens, I just want them there. As I've told people, you know, in, in the um, months that we have given this since the last week of December, we've had one anaphylactic reaction that occurred in the, in the pharmacy. And it was actually with an EMT person. So they knew what was going on and they, they are allergic to a lot of things. So they were kind of anticipating that. Um, but otherwise, um, people have tolerated this very well. And so we just want the parents there because one, they have to give the permission for the child to get the shot. And two, if something does happen, I can't make the decision for the child. It's going to have to be the parent that's there. And can the parent make the child get the shot? That's a good question. You know, I thought about that. And I'm like, you know, one of the things they talk about greatly within the CDC is that this is a very individual decision, right, about getting the vaccine. I think it's a discussion. I mean, you know, I'm thinking, well, how would that go if I'm trying to force my 16 and 17 year old to get something? I'm like, that'd be a tough thing to, to force them. But I like to have an educated discussion with them, an informed discussion, and make sure they feel comfortable about why I want them to get the vaccine. Luckily, my children do listen to what I say, and, and they were all about getting the vaccine. They're not 16 or 17 anymore, but then they're early 20s. Um, so I think it's a discussion that parents should have with their children of that age, and hopefully that the child comes to the, um, the mutual decision that, yes, I should get this vaccine, because it's not just protecting myself, but it's helped me protect other people as well that I love. And I, Dr. Schickel? Yeah, I think uh, no one would recommend, um, and you probably have trouble defending holding a uh, 15 or 16 year old down while you inject them. And, and, and some of these uh, 16 year olds, I'm sure a lot, it would take quite a few people. So my answer is no. 
Uh, we would not do that. You need to, certainly, you need the consent of the parent under uh, 18, but you also need the, the, uh, the receiving individual to be agreeable also. So this is really a public policy question, but I'm going to kick it to you anyway. Um, because we're hearing that some of the colleges and universities are already requiring COVID shots to come back in the fall. Um, can they do that? Can they require that of their students? Um, well, the short answer is yes, they can. Uh, and certainly there are, there are exemptions for medical reasons or for religious reasons. And, and my understanding is it's up to the individual institution. There's a list of colleges that are requiring that. And if someone decides not to just because they don't want to, then there are options for virtual learning, which uh, a lot of people have been sort of experiencing for the last year or so. So the, the short answer is yes, but there certainly are conditions uh, associated with that or different uh, options. Uh, Randy, anything to add? Yeah, there? yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I tell people is that this is an EUA, right? Emergency Youth Authorization by the FDA which I know is some questions that people had about that as well, too. Well, being an EUA, just like at our workplace, I can't force people to get the vaccine being an EUA. If it was an authorized, you know, FDA authorized, which is still going on with these vaccines where they're still doing the, the um, evaluations to get that um, FDA approval, if, um, then you might be able to say, yeah, it's mandatory. But if, if they don't get it, then we have to look at, okay, if you don't get it, then what do you have to do to be able to either go to school or to work? It might be even more remote things that you have to, uh, but you won't be able to maybe come on campus. So there's consequences, right? If you decide not to get it. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things right now where I can't force people to get it because it is an EUA. Stick on that for a minute. What's the difference in what, um, when will the vaccinations become FDA approved and yeah, with an EUA, that's because there's something that's emergent, right? That has happened. So the pandemic was an emergent thing and urgent. And, uh, and so, you know, we, as I said, although it was a shortened period of time, they still have to do phase one, phase two, phase three, right, of the trial. So we first say, you know, does it work in a healthy adult? Number two, is it, is it um, efficacious in the people we're trying to identify? And number three, is it safe and effective? right? And in a, in a larger group of populations, they still have to go um, uh, through that whole process. Um, but with the EUA, because it was an emergent situation, they can't do that full, you know, years of studying. So they apply once they get to that clinical phase three trials and have the data, they apply for an EUA to the FDA, who then has the studies and then gives it the approval. And that's what we saw when Pfizer first came out. When we saw it, you know, we all were watching, right? It's Pfizer's having the FDA come out, then Moderna, then we had Johnson & Johnson. They still have to do these ongoing studies now. And you know, once the pandemic settles down, hopefully we'll reach that sometime in the future. It's only that EUA orders only during the pandemic or only during the emergent situation, then it goes away. So it behooves that the um, manufacturers are still going through the process to get full FDA approval. Yeah. And, and the full FDA approval, and, and, and Randy certainly knows more about that than I do, but it's, it involves dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, looking at potential uh, complications related to pregnancy or breastfeeding, all those sort of things that um, they would do before they get final FDA approval. But the emergency use authorization says this is so important that we will do those ongoing sort of super safety studies while we're using this. Yep. And just to, as a point of clarification, um, you know, once it finally gets FDA approval, similar to, um, I think, like other vaccinations such as the influenza, uh, my understanding is people still can't be forced to do it. They're always going to be given options. You know, one of the options would be, uh, for example, uh, to wear a mask on campus if they're not going to get vaccinated. And, and I think probably in the, uh, in the workplace, too, because all of us, you know, some people are allergic to the flu shot or they have religious beliefs. And so there is always going to be an option out. But with that comes the responsibility of protecting other people, uh, even though you've opted out. So, Great answers. Thank you. So let's move on to women's health issues. And um, will the vaccine affect someone's ability to get pregnant 
or fertility in the future? Absolutely the, not. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they, they've done studies. They've already looked at, uh, and Randy, you may have the specific data, but I think 35,000 so far uh, pregnant women who have received the, the vaccine for COVID and they have not seen any increased complication rate related to this vaccine whatsoever. And also there is no restriction as far as breastfeeding and certainly no indication that there's gonna be any impairment with fertility. Yeah, I totally agree. And we've given uh, vaccinations to um, um, pregnant patients as well too. And uh, you know they were highly encouraged to get it. And, and what you don't want is to be exposed to the virus and being pregnant. And so that's going to cause a lot more complications. So yes, I uh, totally agree with Dr. Shekel. There ha there's um, no evidence that it causes any fertility issues um, and that it's been uh, safe um, and effective in pregnancy. And that continues to be studied by the manufacturers as we talk. And, and just as uh, pregnant women and, and women uh, trying to be pregnant uh, are advised to be updated on all their vaccinations, COVID falls into the same category. Pregnant women are actually at higher risk um, and their, their uh, infant is at higher risk if they catch COVID. So it's all the more reason they should be vaccinated. So will their infant be, uh, get some of the antibodies then from the mother's shot? I, my understanding is that that's not clear, but theoretically uh, that certainly could be the case because most um, uh, Immunity is in some form passed along to the infant. And that's why, you know, for the first up to six months, depending on the condition, uh, there is at least some implied immunity. But I do not have the facts on that. It's more theoretical. And yep. Randy, do you have anything to add to that? Nope, you just took the answer right out of my mouth. So yep, I totally agree. Okay. Let's move on to herd immunity and just immunity. Um, can you maybe, Dr. Schickel, start with what's the difference? And then we'll move on to, you know, some questions around it. Sure. Well, immunity is uh, an individual thing, okay? So if you are vaccinated, you are immune to certain diseases. If you have them, uh, like measles in the past for people prior to the, uh, the vaccine for that, they become immune. Herd immunity re uh, refers to a large group of people who would transmit the disease amongst that community. And, and our biggest community obviously is the United States uh, right now. And so herd immunity implies enough people immune that it is not readily spread amongst other people. And uh, you can never get, I don't think they anticipate zero spread ever, but we wanna get it to a very controllable level so that we can return to normal life. Yeah, the whole purpose of uh, herd immunity is that you have less of a chance for that virus to spread because people have created through vaccinations or um, being exposed to the vaccine and having COVID-19 that they it just peters out, right? There's a dead end. It doesn't have anywhere to go. The numbers have changed a lot over the over the past months, you know, where we said 50 to 60 percent, then we said 70, then we said 80 to 90. They're actually trying to get away from just saying, what is that magic number? Because I don't think we really know. The bottom line is, everybody should get vaccinated because it should, you know, hopefully if people get vaccinated now, when they get exposed to the virus, it just becomes a dead end. It doesn't have anywhere to go. So that's the whole purpose of getting as many people vaccinated as possible. Yeah. If, if there are no hosts for the virus to um, live in, um, number one, uh, they can not mutate. And, and so we need to shut off this sort of clever virus from having a chance to mutate and, and work around our vaccines and the treatments we have for it. You know, it's interesting that you say that, Dr. Shaka, you know, we think about just um, medications like antibiotics and how viruses and, and bacteria have figured out how to get around them. And a lot of times it's because we didn't take it long enough or we stopped it too early. And okay. so it gives the bacteria or the virus time to actually kind of figure out how do I beat this thing? Because you didn't give me the full dose. Well, you can think of herd immunity and uh, the COVID-19 vaccine in a very similar way is that if we give the option for these viruses to figure out how they're going to survive, they will. So we want to get this thing stopped as soon as we can. Exactly. Now, both of you have mentioned this before, um, but you could, this gives you another chance to be very clear. We, get, we have a question from one of our guests that asks, 
Um, isn't it better if everyone just gets exposed to COVID-19 instead of getting a vaccine? If we got exposed, then wouldn't we build immunity to it? <laughs> Randy, you want to take that one? Sure. No. <laughs> No, you don't want to get exposed because you don't know what kind of complications you're going to get from that. And the, the worst complication is death. And as I tell people, I don't care what age you are. And yes, the most vulnerable patients were the ones that, you know, we saw the most severe uh, type of reactions and death. Um, but even with some of the people that were younger, they met with those same consequences. And then you're hearing about people are, are talking about COVID-19 fog um, or they're talking about, man, you know, my, I fatigued all the time or it's settled in my heart and I'm having some heart issues right now. As I told my kids and I tell my friends and I tell my patients, you don't want to mess with this vaccine. So no, you do not want to try to build your own natural immunity by getting exposed and getting the vaccine, uh, getting the actual virus, because that just might set you up for some pretty long-term uh, complications. Yep. And if you think about, as I mentioned previously, um, up to 20% of people getting COVID have serious illness or death, okay? And you think about the risk of the vaccine, it's minuscule. I mean, one of the safest vaccines we've, we've ever developed. And not to mention the long hauler syndrome that uh, Randy was referring to, where people for months and months still have uh, symptoms that prevent them from returning to a normal life. So, and uh, also uh, the scientists feel that uh, the immunity from the vaccine is actually better than the immunity you get from having the disease. And that's why people who have had COVID in the past are strongly encouraged to be vaccinated. Yeah. So definitely a strong no on that one. The vaccine is the way to go, whether you've had COVID in the past or not, uh, sooner the better. Dr. Shuckle, I appreciate you saying that too about um, being exposed, but still maybe not having a full immune response. Because we have seen that, right? And you may have had exposure and you may have had mild symptoms, but I tell you, a vaccine is manufactured and engineered in such a way that it gives you that full boost of an immune response. So it gives you the full protection. Natural immunity may not give that to you. Right. And people who have had COVID, they recommend they're waiting up to potentially up to 90 days, but that's not absolute. Um, you can get it sooner than that. You might just have a little bit more of a uh, of side effects, but People who have had COVID, uh, and certainly people who have not had COVID, need to get vaccinated. So to follow up on that, um, what about people with really good immune systems that eat <laughs> super healthy and exercise and... Some of those people die from COVID, okay? Um, it, it's, uh, it's almost indiscriminate. You would think, oh, well, you'd be hot, more protected. Well, maybe you are, but healthy people, young people, die from COVID. And if somebody has a great immune uh, system, good for them because the vaccine will be effective in them and they'll be even more protected. I would even say, you know, adding to that, there's been people where they're trying to figure out this COVID-19 back um, virus and why the people who are really healthy had these strong immune responses. It was almost too strong of an immune response where it was causing the adverse effects because of your body having this huge response to the virus. Don't mess with the virus. You know, right. you just don't mess with the virus. You don't want to get access to this because even if you have a strong immune response, that immune response in itself could be a, 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 a reaction you don't want to see. And so I just tell people, you know what, this is the time to get the vaccine. Yeah. And the, actually the variants seem to be hitting younger people and these are healthy people. So uh, the, the, the virus keeps mutating and um, I don't care how strong immune, resist, immune system is, these people are still at risk. So we're, we are getting close to the end of our time. We have about 15 minutes left. So I want to um, just pop out a few questions all at once and let you kind of pick and choose from those. And one is just about COVID variants. You were just talking about that. Um, but, you know, as the, the virus continues to mutate after we get our vaccines, um, will we need to get various boosters for that? Or what do we know about it being current vaccines being effective? Another is for, back to herd immunity and with the US getting a lot of the immunization or the vaccine and the rest of the world not all getting fully vaccinated, certainly um, not within the next year or two, uh, do we have to worry about variants 
Um, how are we going to get this under control if we've always got other countries that don't have the vaccine or other people who aren't getting the vaccine? Right, but uh, let me just start with the variants and then I'll turn it over to Randy. Um, okay. Right now, the predominant variant in the United States and Iowa is the UK variant, okay? The other two variants that we're aware of in the United States, but in small numbers are the South African and the Brazil variant, okay? Fortunately, so far, all of the vaccines that are approved for uh, emergency youth authorization in the United States do protect against those variants, okay? Given enough time and uh, ability to mutate, that might change. Uh, but uh, that's good news. And as far as following up on that and also the herd immunity, I'll let uh, Randy take on that one. Yeah, you know, the timing of the vaccines obviously have an impact to determine their efficacy against the variants. Remember, mm -hmm. Pfizer was the first one out of the shoot, then you had Moderna, and that was long before we started seeing these variants occur. So Johnson & Johnson was able to study it in the midst of all of this and show that they had great efficacy against um, both the UK um, and the South Africa. And, uh, but they are now looking on going at the studies. Remember that all this post-marketing surveillance is happening. They're still collecting data and they've shown with the UK variant in particular that both the Pfizer and Moderna have been effective. We will continue to, to evaluate that. So the bottom line is that uh, you're gonna better protect yourself. If you do nothing, you're not gonna protect yourself. It gets back to those three uh, different scenarios that Dr. Shekel talked about at the very beginning. You know, you can get vaccinated, you can get COVID, you can get vaccinated or you can get COVID. Well, to me, the last two options, uh, the last option in particular, you don't want to get COVID. So you want to try to prevent this. And, uh, and so by doing that, then you reduce the chance of these variants to continue to mutate. And are we seeing many of the variants, um, new variants in Eastern Iowa or in Johnson County? I can tell you in Iowa, and I'll have Dr. Sheckle talk about this too, but um, actually the UK variant is the most common now um, of the COVID-19 virus in Iowa. And there's been one case, it wasn't in Eastern Iowa, but at least one case of the Brazil. We haven't seen South Africa, but the Brazil uh, virus as well. Yes, and, that, and that's fortunate, but um, and the, between the South African variant and the Brazil variant in the United States, I uh, have recently seen that they're, they account for only 2%. But these variants, very importantly, are significantly more transmissible than the original one, anywhere from 50 to 70% more transmissible. So if they sort of get a foothold, a lot more people are gonna be infected by this if they're not vaccinated. That's why I call it uh, sort of a race against time. And our race is to get important <clears throat> variants take hold or mutate to even more uh, dangerous variants. Thank you. You know, we have a few people who are, well, more than a few probably in, in the US that are vaccine hesitant for whatever reasons. So are there things that you want to be, you want to tell them now if, if someone on this call has a friend or family member that's vaccine hesitant, they're worried about long-term effects of the vaccine or perhaps not being able to sue um, Moderna or Pfizer because of the PrEP Act, um, which really uh, doesn't allow it, it it uh, removes the liability for them. What would you say to people who are trying to encourage their family friends to get it vaccinated? What, I'll, I'll just jump in there first with a, a couple simple things. I said, number one, listen to the science, okay? Look, listen to the CDC, listen to your uh, state public health department, IDPH, and our local uh, health department, Johnson County Public Health, Washington County Public Health. They have the science, it's based on evidence that's been proven. Do not get your information from social media. There are a lot of wild rumors going out there that people should ignore. And the CDC has excellent resources on all of these questions that people have. And, and that's where the facts are, that's where the science is. So with that, I'll, I'll let Randy add to that. I totally agree. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm an evidence-based guy. And uh, the evidence was very strong to me that, uh, you know, you need to get the vaccine. When I look at some of the myths or some of the um, false uh, statements that are being made about the vaccine, I deal with that with family members and friends. 
I've had some people say now that, you know, the government can track you. I'm like, there's nothing in this that's tracking you. <laughs> you know, then people say, you know, it's affecting my DNA. No, it's not getting into your genetic coding in the nucleus to be able to do that. That's all false stuff. That's not how this thing works. So I try to figure out the reason why someone might be hesitant and then provide them with the evidence to counter that, to say, this is why you should get that. Obviously, this is a very individual choice. I want to make sure people are informed, but I want to make sure they're informed with correct information. So education goes a long ways with this. And I take the time to talk people through it. I don't force it, but I want them to become informed. And I tell you, I've had a lot of people who end up getting it after just giving them time to think about it and then coming back saying, well, they appreciate us providing that information to them. And one thing I might add, an excellent resource in addition to the Center for Disease Control the New York Times just today came out with a very extensive question and answer piece about uh, vaccines, COVID vaccine. And, um, you know, I looked it through and a lot of these same questions are being answered in that piece. And I highly recommend people referring to that because it covers a lot of, um, of extensively a lot of the ground that people have false conceptions about. And we need to stick to the facts and get everybody vaccinated. Absolutely. Thank you. Now I'll give both of you just a few minutes to wrap up, maybe answer any questions or, or state anything you didn't hear asked that you think is important to get out there and maybe direct people to where they can get a vaccine if they're interested. So uh, Dr. McDonough, why don't we start with you? Sure. In reverse order. Well, you know, I like to, um, I like to tell things in stories and and, uh, you know, as I said, we've been given vaccines since uh, the last week of December. And I can't tell you um, the people who have, you know, been very happy and, and uh, just thrilled that they were able to get it um, to the point where people have come crying and bringing a, a plant or a gift to the person who's actually doing the vaccination just because of how much gratitude they have. They are getting the protection that they have. I want to get us back to normalcy. I want to get us back to society that's as close to normal as we possibly can get, where we can be open to go to a restaurant, you know, we can be open to go to a gym um, and not have to worry about this virus spreading amongst ourselves. So I just highly encourage people to use the facts, the true facts, make it evidence, make sure you're informed, and highly encourage everybody to get the vaccine. There's a lot of places now, you know, community pharmacies have access to it. We have continuing access to it. We're working with not only our community members, efficacy groups, public health department to get make sure it gets out there. We're doing remote clinics. We're doing them at the pharmacy. And I know other pharmacies are doing that as well. Plus the health systems, Mercy Hospital, University of Hospitals and Clinics have their um, vaccination clinics. So there's a lot of ways for people to get access to it. And I just encourage you to make sure you do it. Excellent. Thank you. And Dr. Shekel. Yes, thank you. And just um, going back to uh, one of the points about the complication associated with Johnson & Johnson, I just want to clarify so people aren't confused at all. The cerebral venous stasis occlusion or thrombosis, occlusion kind of describes what happens. Thrombosis is the technical term. So that's the condition that is extremely rare, as, as Randy mentioned, less than one in a million. Um, and those sound like more lottery odds than anything else. And so <laughs> It, it's often referred to as CVST. Uh, the thrombosis is a type of occlusion. So, uh, you know, the, this is the the things that people worry about and fear are so much more rare than the horrible complications, uh, including death, that come with COVID. And I, I want people to understand that we are not out of the woods yet. I know people have isolation fatigue for good reason, wearing masks but we need to beat this thing before we get back to normal. States like Michigan are having a crisis right now where their hospitals are 95% full. They're going full uh, fourth surge on this. Uh, countries like India are having a horrible crisis where they, they're totally overwhelming their healthcare systems. So we're not out of the woods yet. We need everybody to rally together for the common cause to get vaccinated. People, until it affects them personally, COVID sounds like almost like the flu to some people. It's not the flu. It's like Russian roulette. You never know who's going to end up on a ventilator and who's going to die. They haven't figured that out yet, but it's a dangerous 
uh, virus. It's a dangerous disease. And we have an incredibly good uh, tool and weapon to fight it. It's called vaccination, okay? And do it for yourself, do it for your family, loved ones, do it for your community and your state and your country. We need to get everybody back to work. We need to get students back in the classroom. We need to get everybody back in uh, social situations and so we can lead a normal life. Um, it's time that this ends and we need everyone's help to make that happen. Rebecca, can I just say one more thing that Dr. Shekel yes. referred to, and that was about the Johnson Johnson. Remember, that meant the system did work as far as a monitoring. And, and so, again, a, an overabundance of caution is what they say that they did, why they put it on pause. They didn't pull it. They put it on pause. It's because the system worked. So yes. this thing is continuously being studied. And so I think people should feel comfortable to know that this is not just the wild, wild west. This is being monitored very closely by science. Good, good point. I don't think we've ever in our history had a safer vaccine that's actually more effective. So get out there and get vaccinated. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Schickel. Thank you, Dr. McDonough. We are so grateful to have your expertise in our communities, your voice, um, answering our questions honestly, and um, really trying to get the facts out there, dispel the myths, and all of us want our lives to get back to normal. I, there, I can't imagine um, going through this much longer, but you've shown us that there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. We just need to continue on the path that we're on. So thank you for your time today. Uh, guests, thank you for attending and submitting your questions. We're sorry we didn't get through all of them, but hopefully we gave you a nice overview of, well, actually in-depth look at what um, we have access to here in this community. A recording link will be emailed to all register guests. And we encourage you to sign up for the United Way of Johnson, Washington County's COVID-19 update email that comes from the United Way. So if you wanna go to the United Way jwc.org backslash COVID-19. That's United Way, jwc.org backslash 19. Um, to sign up for that update, you'll receive those via email. And if you have questions about COVID-19 or vaccination, um, you can utilize United Way's 211 service. So thank you for our panelists, our guests, and the United Way for hosting today. Enjoy your afternoon.